Welcome to TSO Consulting Group's DEI podcast series, Why Is It So Hard? Shining Through the Shadow of Resistance. I'm Dr. Tanya Breland. And I am Erica Lee. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Erica. And I'm Tanya. And this is our podcast, Why Is It So Hard? Shining Through the Shadows of Resistance. And for those of you who have joined us before, you know that in this podcast series, we discuss um, those issues that prevent us from being socially just or free. Yeah. And our goal is to disrupt the status quo, right, of racial inequality and inequity. And in each episode, we challenge each other to do better by being the change that we want to see. We sure do. Um, thanks, Erica. So today, we want to talk about a topic that we just thought was really interesting, and it's storytelling. Yeah. You know, yeah. the power of storytelling. Mm -hmm. But not just for the sake of telling stories, mm -hmm. but really so that we begin to see people. Yeah for who they are and for the experiences that they bring to the table. Yeah. Um, and it really is a tool to understand groups of people. Yeah, I mean, it creates connection, right? It, our, yeah. our brains are so social. And one of the things that it's drawn to is someone else's story. Right. It's the reason why you can sit in class. I remember as a kid, anytime a teacher started with a story or explained, you know, it, using a story, I was all ears. I really wanted to hear yeah. the beginning, yeah. what was happening, and how it ended, right? right? And that really is part of the power of right. telling a story. And, and the same thing with, like, reading aloud, yeah. you know, because mm -hmm. there's something about reading aloud to children that makes the story come to life. Yeah. Um, and, you know, even, it, it was funny when I taught, um, elementary school, you know, I remember at the kindergarten level, the kids weren't yet readers. So because they weren't readers, then, you know, the teachers often would read to them. By fourth grade, teachers would stop reading to the kids. And mm. the experts and the researchers would say, no, continue yeah. doing those read alouds mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. them, not because they can't read, but because there's something to it. You would read yeah. something that's at a higher mm -hmm. level. You know, so maybe like if they were to read it, it might be harder for them mm -hmm. to read. But if you're reading it to them, their their listening comprehension yeah. was much better. Yeah. But it allows not just students, but adults as well to really like learn mm -hmm. about groups of people. I think that's it. I, I think that's it. And I, I love that you brought out that piece about reading out loud. Yeah. Um, you know, my background is literacy and you know, what we know is that the receptive vocabulary is higher than the expressive vocabulary. So what I can take in, it's the reason right. why someone that's, you know, they might be, you know, they might be born into a family where they speak another language so they can understand it, but they may not be able to speak it because right. they're receptive. And I think that's part of the storytelling, right? So we can understand it, right? We may not be able to express what we heard. We may not be able to repeat it, but we can understand it. And it's such a great way to connect with kids because kids love the stories, yeah, right? Yeah. They love the stories. Um, and so I also think, you know, in my family, like my parents use stories as a way to teach us, you know, lessons and morals and and rules and as as and a way history. to explain and history, yeah. right? Yeah. Like mm -hmm. such great such great stories. And I would want them to like tell me again, you know, about that. But absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's funny, I was just saying to you earlier how, you know, I was on a call recently with my, my dad and it was like an hour and a half call. And he's telling me these stories, and they're really family history. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. I wanted to do, I didn't do it, and I should have, in hindsight, I said, <clears throat> I should have grabbed my notebook and just started writing yeah. down these stories that he's telling mm -hmm. me. And they're hilarious, some of them. I mean, some, <laughs> some of the stories were about some of the philandering uncles, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yes. And, uh, and so, you know, like listening to those stories, and I, I sort of remember these are like, you know, my grandmother's uncles. Um, so I sort of remember some of mm -hmm. these uncles, mm -hmm. and hearing their stories was just hilarious yes. to me. But it also talked about, what it also did was it got me in touch a little bit with not just the family history, mm -hmm. but 
dynamics between men and women, yeah, yeah, you know, yes. in mm -hmm. decades past, mm -hmm. in generations mm -hmm. past, mm -hmm. uh, and what those dynamics were like yeah. and what they're like now. Yeah. Um, and so it was like really just interesting to just hear mm -hmm. him share some of those stories. And he shared other, other mm -hmm. types of stories as well. Um, because he sort of sees himself as, as like the family historian. Mm. So it's really interesting because you you can learn a lot about people by the way they tell the story sure. and, and the details that they include mm -hmm. in those stories. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can learn a lot about their values, like their yep. priorities, right? And how they, you know, and I used to ask my dad like, well, what did you do? He's like, I didn't do nothing. I was nine or whatever, <laughs> you know? Um, but um, the other thing, especially the family stories, I just loved because yeah. I started to see myself. So, you know, this auntie did this or this cousin did this. And it's like, I would have done the same thing. Like there's a connection there, sure. you know, or almost like the story was told as caution. Like, listen, it looks like you're going down this road. Let me tell you about what happened previously, you know. But I, but you're right, it's absolutely a part of the tradition because it kept, you know, what was always funny to me is that I would, you know, say to an uncle or an aunt or a cousin, my dad told me about this. And he'd be like, that's not how it happened. And then I'd get another version. Sure, you know? sure. <laughs> you know, um, from another perspective. But it really helped it really helped me to see myself in this family. Yeah. So how do I fit? You know, how how is someone else like what I did or, you know, or the way I am or the way I see things? I think it really kind of helped and it really helped pull us those those family stories. Really, we still tell them, my, yeah. my cousins and I, yeah. you know, to our kids and to each other because um, they're important. Mm -hmm. They're important, you know. It, well, as you were talking, I was thinking about like, the way that I see my upbringing, the way my brother and my sister see our upbringing, if we all tell the story, yeah. it's all gonna be different. All different. And yes. it's not like it's a lie, yes. it's just different. Yes. But what's interesting about that is we think about history that's taught in school, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you know, the history that's taught in school is some historian's point of view, yes. Yes. written in, in historic right. form mm -hmm. for students to learn. That's right. And, and, and if we aren't careful, we'll think that that's the only story. Yes. That's the only story. Yes. That's yes. the only version of that story. Yeah, that's why it's, under, it's really important for us to really understand like <laughs> what dominant narrative means. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, and what because that's that mean? The, well, it's the, <laughs> it's the story that's kind of told and it takes over. Right. And that's the one that we kind of accept as, well, this must have been what happened. Right. right? So um, I remember when I was younger, like hearing about, you know, George Washington, I cannot tell a lie. And remember that one? You Vaguely. chopped down the cherry tree and I yes. cannot tell a lie. Yes. Come to find out that wasn't true. <laughs> like, like what? But I had always heard about it. I had read about it in books and I'd heard about it in, in school and you know, how he couldn't, and, it, and, and, and the narrative was yeah. so that we would think or believe that the first president of the United States was this moral upstanding person. And so this whole thing about, I cannot tell a lie, I, I chopped down a tree, whatever that, whatever that story was, it really was to create mythology, right? So they used narrative, but they used false narrative um, so that there would be sort of this belief around one of the founders of, of the United States. And so, um, so I, but that's part of the dominant narrative. So when I started hearing other pieces of the narrative, I realized you know, kind of like, okay, that's that's not true. And what the purpose of that was, that mm -hmm. was so that, you know, we wouldn't talk about the fact that he was, you know, he owned people, right? That he, you know, victimized and marginalized enslaved people, yeah. um, being a, a, a landowner from Virginia. Um, but we talk about these other things, or and, and when we can't, we make it up, you know? Um, but I think that's a place where they, you know, again, that's the dominant narrative. These are these stories that we hear over and over and over right. again, and it create, you know, belief and it creates expectations and it creates really sort of this mythology around, you know, the story that they want to tell. We really have to do a better job 
even in this country, mm -hmm. of thinking that like there's only one story to yeah, be told. That's right. About groups of people. That's right. Which is really where we're where we're going with this. Yeah, absolutely. And and I, I also think because um, we've had conversations about like so how do we overcome like how do, how do, how do we get to a place where you know different groups you know, don't feel marginalized by each other, or they just get along better. Sure. And I think storytelling is one of those strategies, it right? Is. So it is. when you start to tell me your story, I start to connect, you You're, know. I'm humanized. That's at that right. Point. That's right. And and I start to really like like I can see how that happened. Or, wow, I can't believe you did that. Tell me a little bit more about what you were thinking. Right. You know, those kinds of conversations yeah. that just kind of pull us in and bring us together. And I think sometimes when we're afraid to share our story or when somebody else might be afraid to tell us it really sort of creates barriers or it creates like gaps and yeah, gulfs yeah where that maybe that it could be you know sort of brought together by you know but just by a great story yeah you know absolutely. and we all have them right we all have them right yeah and yeah. it really does give us insight yes you know into, into each who, other in, right into mm -hmm. each other yeah. who people and and so you know, when we think about, because we often talk about race and racism and, you know, some of the, the um, historical challenges we've had in our country. And so, you know, when we think about um, the stories that have been told about black people, mm -hmm. you know, over the years, and mm -hmm. I'm talking like something that predates us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a, a group of uncivilized people, like when you think about like some of the stories that were told about Africans, you know, before bringing them here, like as though bringing them to this shore was a favor because they were living in uncivilized, mm, yeah. you know, society mm -hmm. and they needed, you know, they needed that, if mm -hmm, you will. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Like those stories, unfortunately, are um, really negative stories, but yeah. they're also stories that dehumanized yep. us, yes. you know, and stories, you know, that, um, you know, when you look at, um, Years ago, there was a movie that came out under um, Woodrow Wilson, I believe, was president, The Birth of a Nation. Mm -hmm. And it was an extremely racist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. movie mm -hmm. that told a really racist, stereotypical, mm -hmm. nasty story yeah. about black people That's being right. savages and violent and rapists and, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. the, and the list goes on and on. And so then that then um, gave permission um, to people to basically say, well, if they're savages, if they're not human, if they're violent, then it's nothing for us to harm yes, them. Yes, that's right. You know, that's right. and hurt them. That's right. And so, you know, and, and we're justified in doing so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and that's what would happen. Mm -hmm. But we now, we, we understand what that was doing. Yes. Now we right. understand that. And mm -hmm. we, I feel like we have a responsibility um, to... Um, to um, to get rid of mm -hmm. stories that dehumanize yes. groups of people. Yes, I think that that's so important. Um, years ago, when I was working for a state agency, I, I was I worked for a board, and there was a like a an opportunity to go to like a, a museum there was a lecture or something like that for the board so we coordinated and we went and later i asked one of the board members who was a, a white woman um like how, how did you what did you think about you know how did, how did it go and her words to me was were i just learned so much i did not realize that there was culture in in Africa before you know before people got on ships this is what she said people were got on ships like and her words were they weren't just waiting around to get on a on a boat wow like whoa I would have just never thought at that time that there would be somebody that would think that right wow but you know she went somewhere she you know got this this information somebody was you know really good about you know i'm sharing it and I'm, I'm i'm glad but it was just like that was the first time that i realized that everybody didn't get the same kinds of information around you know history everybody didn't get that like yeah, like i did yeah. around particularly my history yeah you know mm -hmm. you know i you know when i think about this whole um, notion of storytelling um, and how polarized we are yeah. in our country. Mm -hmm. 
I really believe storytelling could potentially be an answer yeah. to that ill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, if we sat yeah. down and talked to people yeah. and learned about who they were mm -hmm. and their families yeah. and their culture and their experiences and their history, we really have an opportunity to connect with yeah. people mm -hmm. in ways that we otherwise may not have connected. It's almost like, you know, you know how people have like different types of, of parties or events or whatever. It's almost like we need a storytelling, you know, like mm -hmm. a cross culture mm -hmm. kind mm -hmm. of event mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, where we get to hear from, and this is just a, a, an idea. Yeah, I think that's great. But, you know, like what if we brought groups of people together to share their stories? Yeah. You know, how powerful would that be? Yes, I think that would be marvelous. And I think people would really get into it as well. Yeah. I mean, that's part of, I mean, that really is sort of the crux of entertainment, right? People want to watch True. a story, right? right? A good so, story. A good story, yeah. right? Um, so I think that that's, you know, I love that idea. And maybe yeah. we can sort of like flesh that out and really kind of bring people together sure. to tell their stories. Sure. So this has been a really great conversation. It like, has you been. know, in terms of, yeah. you know, the power of storytelling. We invite you to share your story with us. Thank you so much for for joining us. Yeah. Um, I just love I'd love we would love to hear to hear your story around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and belonging, um, or even a great story that you heard or that you've shared in the past. Yeah, that mm -hmm. would be wonderful. That would be wonderful. So thank you for joining us yes. again. I'm Tanya. And I'm Erica. And we would love to have you come back and talk to us again. Yes. <laughs> or we'll talk to you. Take care, everybody. <laughs>